everybody. <laughs> this is it. This is it. We're here. We're back. Welcome, welcome, welcome. This is Green Bean, and welcome to episode 72, Refrigerator Perry, Jason Ferguson, episode of Green Beans Jets Pod. I almost forgot what I was doing. I was searching my brain for all the players that wore 72. Uh, episode 72 of Green Beans Jets Pod. I am happy that you are here. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not feeling all that well. And not because I have the flu. It's not a cold or anything. It's that my wife and daughter were not here last night. So my son and I had uh, a little bit of a party. A little movie party. And uh, I got checkers for the first time in... Uh, the last time I can remember was about 15 years ago. I don't eat checkers. I used to eat checkers was in Patterson, New Jersey. That's when I used to eat checkers. A couple times down there in Hollywood, Florida. Uh, I don't eat checkers. And it's not that I, you know, it's not even like a, a whole thing against fast food in general, which I don't eat all that much anyway. But checkers does something. It makes me sick every single time. We got it. My son never tried it. He heard there were you know, the best fries and the whole thing. And I said, you know what? The cat's away. The mice will play. So we got some ice cream. We got some checkers. And I want to die. That's just that's the truth of it, man. I don't feel well. I tossed and turned all night. Oh, one of those. So here I am. I'm going to muscle through it. I'm feeling pale and peaked and weak and dizzy. All the stuff. So let's muscle through this. We do have some stuff to talk about. As you know, I said this in my previous video. Uh, it is the lull, okay? We are here. We are at the lull. There's going to be little drips and drabs, and we're going to talk about them, okay? We're going to talk about them, and this is also an opportunity to talk about some larger ideas. We have time to deconstruct a few things, okay? But when we talk about the, the more insignificant aspects, don't leave me comments and go, Jesus, you're reaching. Like, yeah. I, I, I have to reach. That's what's going on right now. I have some SAC exchange videos coming for you guys. Uh, really good ones, too. I have a great, great story for Mark Gastineau. I have a whole thing on Joe Klecko. We're also going to do a larger SAC exchange video. Maybe I'll do a whole week of SAC exchange stuff. I think that'll be good, especially for the younger fans, the newer fans, because the SAC exchange for me was what got me here. Like, obviously, a lot of you know, my Aunt Gina got me here. She dragged me to the ground round in Bloomfield. Uh, some unsuspecting 10-year-old boy went to the ground round with his aunt and watched the mud bowl. And so that's how it happened. But let me tell you, if it wasn't for the sack exchange and subsequently uh, Freeman McNeil, Wesley Walker, Al Toon, Mickey Schuler, then Kenny O, I did like Richard Todd too, but uh, Kenny O was really my quarterback. And then, so that's how it came. So the sack exchange, without them, I wouldn't be here. I'm, I'm convinced. It was Mark Gastineau and Joe Klecko in particular. While I did love the rest of the boys, I loved the whole defense. Uh, it was those two fellas that, that secured my fandom and on the offensive side of the ball. While I did love Wesley and I did love Kenny O and Mickey Schill, it was all Freeman, man. Freeman McNeil was my guy. I loved him. I loved his face and the helmet. I loved everything about Freeman McNeil. So maybe we'll show you guys a little bit of that stuff. It'll be cool. It'll be cool as we try to navigate the, the slowest part of the year, which is good this time around because it's only a short period of time. Years ago, we had just like, it was like six months of this. You know what I mean? We'd get a little article here and there. Uh, obviously, we had the draft, but it wasn't as big of a deal as it is now. We didn't spend four months doing mock drafts. We had no simulators. So at least there's that. Okay, so we got to be grateful for what we have. If you can't be with the one you love, honey, love the one you're with, right? That's it. And I do. And I do. But before we get into the whole thing, I want to just take a second and remind you that if you're having a good time, if you like the content coming out of here, just give me a little like. It's a little thumbs up button. Go ahead and click on that guy. And if you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, now is a fantastic time to do so. That that puts you in the club, you know. And then if you want to be, you know, if you want to make sure that the YouTube algorithm uh, really reminds you every time I do anything, hit the little bell, and that will get them to do that. And guys. 
if you want exclusive content, if you want even more access, uh, lots of hangs, I mean, my guys text me, I get right back to them. Uh, it's, a, it's an open line of communication. We have get-togethers and, and, and extra content. You can join the Beanbaggers, and that link is right in the description of this video. Go ahead and click on that. Get in the group and have a good time with us. It's growing every single week, and I love it. I'm super grateful. So with all that said, thank you for being here, guys, and thank you for all the support that you give me. Uh, let's get right into this one today. I'm going to try not to fluff it up. Let's, let's just get right into this with the news of the week. So an interesting thing took place. Now, I want you guys to know something. If you're new around here with me, I'm going to tell you something. And never forget this. I love tight ends. I love them. I think the tight end position is mismanaged. Uh, I think that only a few select teams know what they're doing, realize what they have. And you see those teams winning Super Bowls or at least being very, very good teams consi you know, consistently, whether it's back from Antonio Gates or Tony Gonzalez. You got the Jay Novacek's of the world, the Jason Wittens, you know, all that. Now we have Kittle and, and Kelsey, all those guys, which I always go back and forth if it's Kelsey or Kelsey. I, I don't know what to do anymore, okay? I just don't know what to do. Kels, Kelsey? I don't know. If I say Kels, somebody will tell me it's Kelsey. If I say Kelsey, somebody will tell me it's Kels. So I'll just do that, okay? So there he is. I love the tight end position, and it just so happens that my favoriteest of teams, the New York Jets, have ignored this position by and large for uh, 40 years, 35 years, pretty much. Yeah, sure, we've taken a couple swings. And when we did take swings at the tight end position, it was ill-advised swings. You know what I'm saying? Like, we had the big one was Kyle Brady. We used a first-round pick on Kyle Brady. Hey, dude, the guy had a very, very good career, only a short period with the Jets, but he had a very good career in Jacksonville. He's been to the Pro Bowl, okay? Super uh, tight end type build, very good blocker, very good hands. But we took him over what we really needed, which was Warren Sapp, who, as we know, is in the Hall of Fame, and every Jets fan wanted him. Sapp, we want Sapp, we want Sapp. The whole thing. Nope. We go ahead and take Kyle Brady. Now, uh, we've also used another first-round pick right in the similar era. We took a, a swing on Johnny Mitchell, and boy, oh boy, did Johnny Mitchell look good. Didn't he look good? Turned out he had some emotional stuff, uh, and... Uh, Ended up like quitting, retiring, coming back, all kinds of stuff with him. Sad because he was an uber talented tight end. Other than that, we're we're essentially a fifth round, you know, fourth round, uh, sixth round pick kind of tight end team. We sign a lot of guys off the scrap heap. Uh, well, even recently, you know, Griffin, Croft, uh, those types of guys. They're scrap heap guys. You know, that that's what they are. Like an afterthought, right? Now, if you use the tight end correctly, it can change everything. And that's what people are trying to impress upon the NFL. Kittle, the tight end for the San Francisco 49ers, is putting together something called Tight End University. All right. Now, this is where they gather all the tight ends from around the league, at least the ones that are available. There's over 40 scheduled to arrive and participate in this three-day tight end retreat. They get together and they go over all sorts of different stuff, how to embolden the position, but it's really about getting the tight ends to be a unified front so they can uh, increase their value, not only to the team, but as a positional group. Kittle went on to say that the tight ends are singular, like they're, they're, they're alone on the field. Like most of the time, yes, you have teams that run 12 or, or 22 and there'll be two tight ends out there, but more times than not, 11 personnel has one tight end. So you got all the linemen, you got two guards, two tackles, you got two running backs, you got three receivers, and the tight end is out there by himself. Now that also applies to the quarterback, but nobody's going to talk about the value of the quarterback, right? But the tight ends are kind of this, they're just this guy out there is he a lineman nah not really is he a receiver nah not really and when you look at how the jets have put this together the jets really have gone the exact way i think you shouldn't look at tight ends which is we get one who's a blocker 
one who's a receiver. And they can't really do the other job, right? Like, we know we had Eric Tomlinson for a while, who's done better for the Ravens. I, I think he just got cut this year, and they, they brought a bunch in from the draft that I like. Eric Tomlinson, he was on our team. He's known as a blocker. And every now and then, we'd throw him the ball, and he'd catch you something here and there. But Eric Tomlinson, the reason why Jets fans didn't like him is because when he would get wide open, which nobody cared on the defense... Because they knew we'd throw it to him, and he had no better than a 50% chance of catching it. No better. And he has dropped some very, very big, lucrative plays for us. So the Jets have done that for far too long. We have two separate guys that do two separate jobs. When, if you really want the tight end position to matter, you get a guy who can block and catch. Now, if you want to add just a purely receiving tight end on top of your main guy, fine. That's great. You can have extra guys, but it limits your offense when you put a tight end out there and all he does is block. The defense now knows we don't have to worry about this guy. Of course, there are those rare opportunities where he's going to do something like that, but by and large, they, they, they don't need to worry about it. Now, if you put a receiving guy out there and he can't block worth a damn, what do they know? He's going to he's going to be going out on a route, right? So you limit what your offense can do. When you look at a guy like Kittle or Kelsey Kels, you put those guys out there. They can block and they can receive. And that makes them dangerous. And we see it happening. So the Jets finally look like they're putting this, this effort into tight ends. And we'll get into that more a little bit later. This is not about them per se. So the tight end university thing is announced and everybody's psyched. If you didn't know, CJ Uzoma will be there. Conklin is not going to be there, nor are the other tight ends on our roster. Well, you could look at it this way. Chris Herndon's going to be there, so that's real good, right? Hey, maybe. Well, Chris Herndon will be there, but CJ Uzoma, our free agent tight end, our, the first one we signed, will be at tight end university. But that's not even the news. The news is Kittle announced that Trey Lance is going to be there. Now, why would he want his quarterback there? Because it's valuable. He wanted his quarterback to be there, his young, uh, strong-armed, athletic quarterback to be in the group. Why? Because hanging out with that many tight ends is going to be of value to him. In addition to Trey Lance, it's also speculated, he said, we're very close to grabbing Zach Wilson to participate in this. Now, I got ecstatic. Why? Well, number one, I like when our players are included, and it's not always the case, right? We're kind of an afterthought in many respects. You guys know this. I know this. So just on that level, it feels good. But I happen to think that this will be valuable as we're in this position where we're going to shift focus on our offense to including tight ends. If you think we brought in two tight ends in free agency and our third round pick on top of having Kenny Yaboa and Wesco, if you think that we're not focusing on the tight end, I don't know what you're drinking. All right, There is a premium being placed on the tight end position for the New York Jets. So what better then for our young second-year quarterback, then to go hang out with 40 of some of the best in the NFL at that position so he can start to develop that chemistry, that comfortability, that understanding of what the tight ends really are in the NFL. Now, if you're wondering who is going to be there, it's guys like Kelsey Kels, or Kelsey Kulsey, Kles. It's guys like Travis Kels, uh, Kittle, Greg Olson, Darren Waller, Mark Andrews, Zach Ertz, Evan Ingram, Noah Fant, Austin Hooper, Kyle Rudolph, even Cole Kmet, uh, Mike Gazicki, right, receiving guy, Jonu Smith, Logan Thomas, Tyler Higby, Eric Ebron, Kyle Pitts, Dallas Goddard, David Njoku. You got guys like Irv Smith and Hunter Henry, uh, Chris Herndon, like I said, Hayden Hurst, Dalton Schultz, all sorts of guys, TJ Hawkinson, and as I mentioned earlier, CJ Uzoma. And that's not even the whole list, guys. That's not even the whole list. Who better for Zach Wilson to hang out with as he's about to be immersed in a tight end heavy offense, then the best tight ends in the entire NFL for a three-day retreat. And this is the stuff. 
This is the stuff that's going on out there. Now, you know, when you look at, you know, is Zach Wilson going to have a uh, a second year jump? Is he the guy? People are already trying to label this guy a bust. It's crazy out there. What do we want to see when you can't play games? You want to see things like work ethic. You want to see things like inclusion, connection. He traveled the whole country to play with his wide receivers, right? Now he's going to a three-day retreat with Tight End University. Guys, this is exactly what we want for Zach Wilson to be doing in the off season. So I, for one, like it. I think it is fantastic, and it was music to my ears when Kittle announced, oh yeah, and we have another young gun, Zach Wilson, uh, almost confirmed. So there's still that little bit of a chance that he might not go there, but again, the thought process is even a positive for me. I like this stuff. I think Zach Wilson uh, will be better the more things like this that he can be included in, maximizing the value of your off time, your downtime. What better than hanging out with 40 of the best tight ends in the NFL? Now, another thing that happened this week was the NFL Players Association rookie premiere. What do you think of that? That was a mouthful. Well, let's do it the long way. The National Football League's Player Association's rookie premiere. There you go. So they all got together for some pictures and some fun and all that. And what was positive about that was this was the first time ever that we got to see Sauce Gardner, Garrett Wilson, and Brees Hall in their official Jets uniforms. Now, I guess there's still the chance that either Wilson or Brees Hall could change their number again, so we don't know that uh, officially yet, but it looks pretty good. Uh, Garrett Wilson has already gone out there and said he likes 17, G17, he's calling himself. Brees Hall had 35 when we first uh, put him in a jersey for, for practice. As soon as Sauce Gardner changed from 20 to number one, he jumped on 20. It's close to 28. So I think, uh, I think this will probably end up being his number. And I think it's good. I think it's a good one. It seems like he likes it. So that's good. So we had all these guys together for some photo opportunities with a bunch of other rookies from this year's draft. And we got to see what they look like. Now, a funny thing came out of this. Uh, well, I don't know why Jermaine Johnson wasn't there scheduling. Who knows? But he wasn't. So they added our second round pick, Brees Hall, which is another, it's a little nugget, man. You got to think, they're including our second round pick as, as like a premier draft pick guy, which is interesting. But the funny thing that came out of this was the facial expression on Brees Hall when they took the big team photo op. Now, it's a funny thing, and Jets fans had some fun with it on Twitter. Uh, he looks like a guy who means business. Now, that could just be one of those split seconds, right? We don't know. Pictures are weird. You, you know, you can be like, uh, you know, you can make all sorts of weird faces. But no matter how you slice it, the, what they did capture looks like a guy who is not playing games. He's here to succeed. And like one of the things that I see out there is just like, man, I wouldn't want to be tasked with stopping that guy. And it's true. And it's just another positive wrinkle. Doesn't mean too much, right? But it's a positive thing. Number one, seeing our rookies out there with their official jerseys on. Obviously, Sauce Gardner was wearing number one, which did push DJ Reed to number four. I'm not sure if you knew that. DJ Reed is going to wear number four. So now we got two cornerbacks, number one and number four. This is going to be weird. We have these guys out there in their jerseys, so it's super cool. But again, when you look at our, our, our draft class, we have three first round picks on many people's boards, three top 10 picks, worst top 15, right? On most people's boards, we got three top 10 picks or top 15 picks, and then you get a running back who was arguably, but almost unanimously, the best running back in the class. And the NFL knows that. He was included, and it's nice to see. That is the news of the week. So guys, the positive buzz out there is very, very real. Now you're going to start to see, and you already have, there's going to be the stones, right? When you look at just what we did, this offseason, stacked on top of 
last offseason, stacked on top of what we accomplished last year, what we really did last year. Sure, it was four wins. Sure, we had the worst defense in the league, but it was what we did while doing that that makes it so valuable. Getting all these young rookies their, their first year under their belt. Development progress. That's what it was all about last year, and we accomplished that. So if the 2020 class Becton comes back, Denzel Mims, Ashton Davis has a little turnaround. Maybe Michael Pirine, uh, you know, carves himself a role as the third or fourth running back. Stuff like that. If we can do that, then those three years consecutively leading into this one, right, it's really showing a team that is starting to be built correctly. And we're starting to bring in some real talent, talent that other teams are upset they didn't get. Those kinds of guys, all right? Like you, you guys all saw the, the video with Buffalo fans wanting Brees Hall. They were livid that the, that the Jets were the team that ended up getting them. Why? Because they know. All right. Now, nobody knows anything about what any of these guys are going to be in the NFL. We know that. But all we can look at is potential for the prospect. And Brees Hall looks like an absolute stud muffin. And other people are envious of the draft class. This is not normal for us, guys. Usually speaking, other teams' fans are like, eh, that guy's pretty good. Or, hey, I think you might have got a good one here. Nobody ever looks at our draft class and says, wow. That's what's going on right now. Even last year, don't forget. Don't forget what we did last year. We had the two firsts, Zach Wilson and ABT. Elijah Moore on everyone's board was a first. He's just the guy that slipped through the second. It happens every single year, man. Don't forget the first like five or six picks of the second round. If you look at the wide receivers taken there, they're all pro bowlers. All right? That's a fantastic sweet spot for wide receivers in the NFL, and we got one there. Then you add Michael Carter on top of that, and that's not even to talk about the back end of the draft class. Just look at what we did. People thinking, really, we got three first-round picks last year. We got three first-round picks legitimately this year, but arguably four. That's seven first-round pick talents in the last two years. So when you just look at it, and then you look at the offseason, uh, you know, the free agent period, bringing on a Pro Bowl guard, bringing on two tight ends, bringing on two young defensive backs in Jordan Whitehead and, and DJ Reed. When you look at how we're doing it, it's intelligent, it's well thought out, it's very systematic. We're working on the, on the units that have the most impact first. We're working on the more, on the higher impact positions, which is what? The premier positions, right? Things like cornerback, edge rusher, wide receiver. That's what we're seeing go on. And like I keep trying to tell everybody, tight end. It's coming. The tight end is the thing. You'll see. You'll see. I know I've been wrong for probably 27 years straight. And as you guys know, the last real tight end we had who went to the Pro Bowl was 1988 Mickey Schuler. Dude, that is too long, man. Way too long. But that's the truth of it. Now, again, I've been talking about tight ends for years. It hasn't happened for me. So, yes, I've been incorrect. I've been wrong. But that doesn't mean I still don't know. Okay? Sure, I've been wrong. But that doesn't mean I'm not right. And I am. I'm telling you, the tight ends are the thing in the future, especially in this particular offense. It's all turning the corner, and we happen to be focusing on them. So when you think of Uzoma and Conklin and Ruckert on top of Yaboa and Wesco, if we should keep whoever, how, however we do it, dude, this is probably the best tight end room that we've had in at least 20, 25 years. At least. That's what we're looking at here. So when you look at this team objectively, yes, we're fans. Yes, I'm going to try to find the silver linings. That's what I do. I get it. But all of my feelings aside way over here, when you look at this team objectively, it's very hard to dump on what this team is doing. It's very hard. It's very hard to do. So... With that all said, there are still the Grumpkins. There are still the people out there saying stuff, trying to keep it in the negative. And for the solution to that, we're going to get into the intelligent gripe. 
So way back when we were having this wonderful draft weekend, everybody was saying, oh my goodness, the Jets, I can't believe it. Sauce and Wilson and Jermaine Johnson at 26. They got the best running back. Oh my God, Max Mitchell's all but a starter in a year or two. Holy cow, Michael Clemens. You know, it's like that's what's going on out there. And it didn't take too long. We were immersed in this week of positivity. And somebody slithered right in there. We know who it is. We don't got to mention it. But he goes out there publicly and he says, I think the Jets' season is going to be over before the bye. I can see 1-8, even 0-9 to start the season. Okay. So what happens? Everything starts to get shaky and wobbly. Don't forget, Jets fans, we stand on, on very shaky ground. Right? We've had a lot go wrong in our past. So it's understandable. But it's also understandable why someone would do this if you remove, you know, the viability of it. Just, just alone, without any facts or anything. The motivation for doing something like this is because we respond. Now, we've been talking about this for years. We respond. We make it a big deal. If somebody says something and we go, yeah, yeah, whatever, and we don't respond to it, it just slips off into the past. But we like to make it a big deal. We like to defend ourselves. We like to be respected. All those kinds of things. So there we were. We're, you know, we're arguing. We're this and that. But what happened as a result of that is a lot of Jets fans started to get, you know, nervous. Are we going to start 1-8? Can we start 0-9? Sure, we can start 0-9. You look at what the NFL schedule looks like for us. Dude, they gave us zero favors. Make no mistake, they could have sprinkled in a Jacksonville or a Detroit or a Chicago Bears. They could have done that in the beginning. No, they give us the entire AFC North, which all four are perennial Super Bowl candidates, right? Especially the last few years with Cleveland's turnaround and Cincinnati. These are the, this is a tough division. They give us that to start the season, the entire AFC North. Why are they doing that? Now, I don't know. But it's definitely not because they're trying to be nice. I'll tell you that. Now, we don't know what they're going to be in the future. All right, Every year, a, a team that's supposed to be great sucks, and a team that's supposed to suck is good. We see that every year. Maybe that's what's going to happen. Maybe in hindsight, we look back and go, oh, thank God we got those three teams to start the season because they suck. Maybe. But as it looks right now, it's a gauntlet. Now, right after that, we have teams like the Patriots, the Bills, right? Our own division. So when you go into the bye, it's going to be, it's, it's, it's a tough stretch. So yes, we could, but are we going to? Nobody knows. But when somebody says that, this is what I think, in the middle of our positive week, they didn't let us get a week of positivity without going, eh, and that's what they did. The response from the Jets, fandom is is very very it's very robust so we get all kinds of clicks we get all sorts of uh you know side articles you know how it goes right now there's not really all that many actual journalists there's a couple and then everybody just looks at a tweet and makes a story about a tweet that that's what they did that's, that's journalism today that's sports journalism so that's what they do so all that stuff starts happening and then jets fans start to think it's truth and we start questioning i knew we shouldn't have taken sauce gardner we should have taken thibodeau I knew we shouldn't have taken Garrett Wilson. We should have taken Traylon Burks. They love him over there in Tennessee. Which, by the way, Traylon Burks had a very, very bad string of initial practices with heat stroke-ish kind of things, vomiting, all that kind of stuff. If that was happening here, it would be the biggest story in the NFL. But it's the Titans, so nobody cares. It's just, oh, yeah, yeah, Traylon Burks having a hard time. That's all it is, and it'll just go by. Isn't it funny that the comments about the Jets' hypothetical season is a bigger story than Traylon Burks having... You know, having a, uh, a very, very difficult uh, week of rookie training camps and all that sort of stuff. Isn't that interesting to you? And why? Because of our response. So what happens is, number one, Jets fans are getting nervous. We start questioning ourselves. And I'm already seeing this stuff. Joe Douglas missed the boat on this draft. I got a couple DMs. I did. I also see it on Twitter feeds. I see it. People are questioning. When a few days earlier... There was very, very, very little of that. Now, you guys know, I wasn't even in, in the camp of take Sauce Gardner. I wasn't. I wasn't in the camp of take a cornerback in the whole draft. Does that mean that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to crap on the pick? No, because he's a great player. So you can't argue with talent. Not the guy I wanted, 
but it's definitely not a negative that we took him, especially because we got uh, Jermaine Johnson later in the first round. Now, that makes that first round studly, okay? Absolutely studly. So what happens, though? Jets fans are getting nervous. We start questioning ourselves, and we start this little tiny bit of uh, infighty kind of stuff. But on top of that, what is bigger is you start to see the also-rans. All right. Now, other people are starting to jump out there, say ridiculous things with the sole purpose of upsetting us and getting our vigor and our passion to boost their fledgling careers. And that's what we see. Now, I'm not even going to give this guy his name, nothing. I'm not going to do anything. But there's one guy in particular out there that is so motive driven it's incredible he's got about 1200 followers on twitter or something like that he claims to be a former staff member all this kinds of stuff but he's trying to sell a book the unauthorized he's trying to do that and he's out there saying very very opinionated stuff and i see jets fans attacking him who does that serve does it serve you to be upset does it serve me to be upset no does it do anything about the jet season? No. Does it mean anything whatsoever? No. He compared Zach Wilson's season to Mike White's few games. Dude, Mike White was a four, a fifth year vet at the time who came in two games in the year. Like comparing that, and it was historic. I mean, think about it. Mike White's game was so out of the ordinary that the jersey made it into the Hall of Fame. So using that as a catalyst to have any opinions about somebody else, it's just not, it's just not real. But what this does is it starts to get Jets fans uh, passionately inflating somebody who is clearly out there with one reason and one reason only to upset us. He has no real, he doesn't give a shit about Jets fans. It's a guy who's not even a fan of the Jets. So why is he talking so much about our players? This is my advice. Don't give him a click. Don't respond. Block him. Don't even look at this guy. Don't even do it. Because he only wants to further his career, which doesn't look like it's doing anything. He's already written the book. He's already, you know, a former this and a former that. It's not going well for this guy. Just leave him alone. Now, if you want to come at it correct, sure, we can have a conversation with anybody. But that's not what he's doing, okay? So my advice to you is leave it alone. Don't give these guys your time. Now, let's talk about Zach Wilson because we see so much stuff. It's time we talked about Zach, all right? Let's talk about him. You know, the news of the week, I told you he was doing the whole tight end university thing. Very, very positive. We also saw this offseason, he was meeting with his wide receivers in Miami, in uh, Arkansas, and wherever else, in Nashville, right? We see positive things happening. Now, if you can't see last year's progression, if you le legitimately look at what last year was, just without feelings, just look at what last year was. If you can't see the progression, the settle, the improvement, then you don't know what you're looking at. It's really quite simple. Jets fans have every reason in the world to be excited about Zach Wilson. Every single reason in the world. He clearly has the arm strength. He's known as an, uh, just an uber-accurate quarterback. He's got elite escapability. We've seen that numerous times. He would have had 20 more sacks if it wasn't for him escaping it. Robert Sala at the end of the year said, that stuff that we saw from Zach isn't fluky. That's his word. It's not fluky. It's his skill set. So not only does he have a rocket arm, probably the strongest arm we've had on a young quarterback in maybe ever since Namath kind of a thing, but he's got the escapability. He's got it all. Okay, now what does he do? He comes into camp, he gains six pounds of muscle. Why is that a big deal? Tell me why it's a big deal. Is it because we want a big, strong, muscular quarterback? Maybe. Maybe. Maybe you like the way he looks in the jersey. and Maybe you like that. It makes me feel better. Good. Because that's not a negative. 
But the real reason is this. This is Zach Wilson's first NFL offseason with our medical staff, which, by the way, was in their rookie season last year. The entire revamping of our medical department, training department, nutritional department, rehab departments, they were all in their rookie year last year. So this is the first offseason that our staff can have an impact on our players. What's the first result? Six pounds of muscle for Zach Wilson. Okay? So there, this is the stuff that you look at. You look at his rookie season. The first quarter of the season, the number one most sacked, pressured, hurried, and hit quarterback in the NFL for the first four or five games of the NFL, of the season. Okay? What, what about another stat? Another stat is this. He was also the quarterback with the second most catchable balls dropped last year. So, Zach Wilson's season... His completion percentage was 55% completion percentage. But he had the most catchable balls dropped last year. Most of them by, by uh, Corey Davis and Ty Johnson. Okay? And Berrios and Mims and Jeff Smith. And it's like, it's, it's, you know. So that is real. All right? That is real. Oh, it's an excuse. Is it? Is it an excuse that he was the most hurried, hit, pressured, and sacked quarterback in the NFL? That's how he started his NFL career. You want to talk about dirt balls and all? Yeah, I think, I think, yeah. I think that's probably a normal response. But again, we saw that be the way that the season started for him. Erratic, nervous, running around, all that sort of stuff. But with good reason. He wasn't in the pocket with happy feet. That's not what we saw. We saw a guy get rocked. His welcome to the NFL was unsurpassed violence. Okay? That's what it was. Remember the stat? He had 1.7 seconds to throw the ball before pressure was in his face. 1.7 seconds. Hi! There it is. There it is. All right? So we have that. Now, throughout the season, if look, if you if that's the whole season, and it, you can't make anything positive about it. But what happened is he got injured by a friggin' dirty hit, by the way, which no flag and all that stuff. That's another thing entirely. And it was a dirty hit. He gets injured. Mike White comes in, has the Mike F and White game. And then Zach comes back in a couple games later. And he throws one interception in, se in seven games, I think it was, six or seven games. Five straight games without one. Nice and calm collected, looked like he was running the offense smoothly, so why didn't we win or anything like that? Well, because, again, the drops continued, and number two, all of his receivers were hurt. Everybody. All the way down to Braxton Berrios, man. Corey Davis was out for a couple weeks at the end to end the season. Elijah Moore was out. Obviously, Denzel Mims was had whatever the hell was going on with him. You had Berrios out the last, I think it was two games. We had guys like Jeff Smith and Tariq Black and, and DJ Montgomery running around. All right? But still, no interceptions, much, much calmer, collected, ran the offense. The guy looked like a different quarterback. Now, it didn't work out yet. Fine. It's a rookie year. All right? Now, let's take a look really quickly. And I just, I'm going to be honest with you, I just did a quick scan. This information took me less than a minute to find. All right? Less than a minute. I just said, uh, give me some rookie quarterbacks that had rough rookie years. All right? So, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to give you a four or five right now that had worse rookie years than Zach Wilson and ended up getting to be a Super Bowl winning quarterback. All right? Let's start with uh, Terry Bradshaw. A blast from the past. I remember Terry. He owned the league when I was a kid. He had 1,410 yards, a 38% completion percentage, six touchdowns, 24 interceptions. Okay? Uh, let's go a little bit closer in time. Let's get Troy Aikman. Troy Aikman had 1,749 yards, 53% completion percentage, nine touchdowns, 18 interceptions. If you want the comparison, Zach Wilson had 2,234 yards, nine touchdowns, 11 interceptions, and a 55% completion percentage, right? So let's get a little bit closer still. 
John Elway. I don't know if it's closer, actually, but another one. John Elway, 1,663 yards his rookie season, 47% completion percentage, seven touchdowns, 14 interceptions. Now let's give it to current, somebody who just won the Super Bowl. Let's look at Matthew Stafford. Matthew Stafford's rookie year went something like this. 2,267 yards, 53% completion percentage, 13 touchdowns, 20 interceptions. So again, right in the same pocket, more touchdowns, but more picks. When you look at this stuff, guys, the big difference is that everybody's laser focused on Zach because he's a New York Jet. That's it. And the only reason it's even a story right now is because we're responding. Okay, I am going to tell you something. Zach Wilson is fine. We got him the protection he needs. When he was protected, he was fine. All right. We upped his talent at the wide receiver and tight end positions. We raised his talent with the running back position with adding Brees Hall. It's going to be fine. With Zach Wilson, what you're looking at is a team that understands. You're looking at a team that is building around a rookie quarterback properly. All right. We already saw that Mike LaFleur at least has the potential to be a creative and successful offensive coordinator in the NFL. We don't know what he's going to be, but the potential's there. We saw it. All right. So when anybody's attacking you about Zach Wilson, oh, look at the miss more interceptions, blah, 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 blah. Cool. Cool, man. You as a Jets fan should be very, very confident about this guy. Can we allow him to have a career? Can we allow him to have a rookie year? Can we acknowledge the progress that we saw in this rookie quarterback? And you guys will remember, I'm not even a Zach Homer. I'm not. I'm trying to look at things as objectively as I can. I look around. Let me see rookie years. Everybody wants to compare him to Justin Herbert and uh, and whoever else just came out, Joe Burrow. Dude, that is not the norm. So just slow down. Zach Wilson is fine. He's got every measurable that you want. He's not small, by the way. He's over six foot two. All right. We're not talking about Kyler Murray. Guy's six foot two and change. Matter of fact, six foot three. That's right. You heard it. I'm saying he's six foot three, six foot two in like three quarters or something like that. He's big enough. He's strong enough. He's smart enough. He's athletic enough. He's accurate enough. He's got the, the strength of his own. Dude, it's everything is there. Let's just calm down and not let these people with specific motivations get under our skin. We're going to show them. We're going to show him this year. Now, I don't know if we'll have a winning record or not, but everybody's going to take that question off the table this year. We gave him the weapons. We gave him the team. We gave him the line. Second year. You'll see. So there you go. That is the intelligent gripe. So right on, man. Look, don't let everybody bug us. You know, we bug ourselves enough. You know what I'm saying? It's going to be a fun year. We have to know that progress is positive. Progress is positive. We went 10 years with none. Even the team in 2015 that we had, you know, that we had some fun with, dude, they were mercenaries. We knew that. That had to happen that year or it was over. And we give Fitz money. We knew. Come on. We knew. We knew that shit was over. That was their moment. So this is not a paid mercenary team. This is a team packed full of homegrown talent. And the guys that aren't homegrown are young. Look at DJ Reed. Look at Jordan Whitehead. Look at Tyler Conklin. Look at these guys. Sure, we have Lake and Tomlinson, CJ Zoma, some very, very well-placed vets. More than not, we have a young hungry team with not one overpaid person to play here dude we're on to something here i can't wait till week one i can't wait i can't wait i have never been this confident in the team 
in the team. And to start stomping through this league. So let me know what you think, guys. Let me know. Are you upset about these guys? Don't let them ruffle your feathers, man. They're purposely trying to do that. Don't give them what they want. A saying that I like is, don't let them rent space in your head for free. He's not even paying rent. Get out. Just block them. You can, you can see the motivations. You don't have to argue with everybody. We don't have to get into an argument with everybody. If somebody's purposely trying to antagonize me, so get out of here. Beat it. So let me know what you think in the comments. You confident about Zach? What do you think of this tight end university, man? What do you think of our tight ends? I got a whole tight end video coming this week. Ooh, it's about time. I've been waiting. I've been waiting for the tight ends, and it's finally here. Guys, I hope you have a fantastic rest of the week. Let me know how you're feeling, how you're thinking. In the comment section, don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't done that already. And thanks again for being here with me. And as always, go Jets.